Um, right. So, can I just see, show of hands, who has been to one of our events before? Oh, right, quite a number of you. Okay, great. And who hasn't been? Right, there's more of you. Okay, great. Um, now, if you have been here before, you'll know this stuff that I'm about to tell you, which is that, but the, those of you who haven't been, you really want to listen to this, which is the toilets, really important. We've got some gents here, just right there. And then, down uh, the corridor, if you walk down this corridor on the left-hand side, you will find some ladies. Uh, we have more toilets, just in case. We've got uh, the ladies again, uh, just down the stairs, and the gents, this, these are the stairs that you've just come up, right? You've got the gents uh, just up the stairs, and the ladies just down the stairs. So you've got toilets on this staircase, and you've got to toilets right there, and you've got toilets down the corridor. Um, we've also got some tables for phone charging, so if you brought your charger, you can charge your phone halfway through the day if you've been tweeting like mad during the morning. The other thing I want to say to you is that there are several queues for food. So don't end up stuck in a queue that's massively long because there are lots of different queues. So just go and find another queue. Um, I found out something, obviously it's my age that has made me realize that, or didn't make me realize, that when you are doing a hashtag, you don't have to put capitals. You know, all of the time, uh, all of our other conferences, I've always been there making the, m the capital on the M for Michaela. And it, it just slows me down. And you don't have to do it, apparently. So when you are tweeting, you can tweet hashtag Michaela, and you don't have to put the capital. Um, and if you want to tweet uh, ideas for the next event, you can tweet hashtag next event, because we'll look at that after, uh, after today. I'm really interested in your ideas. Um, the other thing is that we're really excited about well, at least I'm really excited, is that we've got this new system. You know, this, this, so we have microphones. I mean, this is really exciting because for those of you who were here before, you will remember that we had this ridiculous kind of portable speaker that we were rolling around. And I said, you know, we sort of look like six formers. So um, let's try and get a little bit more professional. And um, now we are. And uh, that means that people at the back can hear me, which is really great, even with the windows open. Um, and so that is super exciting. And it means that at the end of uh, this, each, each speaker, uh, there will be roaming mics coming around for you to be able to ask questions. Uh, so timings of the day, uh, you're gonna hear from me first, then you're going to hear from Joe Kirby, then you have a half hour break, then you've got three sessions from Joe Facer, Joe Allen, Jessica Lund, and then you've got an hour for lunch, then you've got two sessions from Olivia Dyer and Katie Ashford. And then you have half an hour again in the afternoon. And then you'll hear from Leah Martin uh, in the afternoon. And I will close the day at the end. So that's, those are the timings for the day. To let you know, uh, friends of yours and so on who might want to see videos of the event, they should be available for Tuesday next week. Okay, So uh, people who are tuning in on the live stream, fantastic, they're seeing that now, but everyone else will need to wait till Tuesday to see these. And the last thing I wanna say is, if anyone knows of any art teachers, we're looking for an art teacher, so please do tell all your friends <laughs> that we are looking for an art teacher. Now, I am about to tell you what I'm going to talk about. Uh, right. Uh, when someone is interested in working at Michaela, we always ask, are you willing to question everything? That's what we ask them. Are you willing to question everything? That's what we're about. Questioning what seems obvious. That, that is really what we're about. All of us here who work here used to think so differently about so many things, in particular me. I used to think that the reason kids in the inner city misbehaved was because they live in poverty. I used to think that Lessons that included rap songs or other entertaining type activities were good because it made learning fun. I used to think that it was pretty shocking to suggest that the best that has been thought and said could even be defined, let alone that one's aim should be to teach the best that has been thought and said. I used to think if we just worked, if all of us just worked really, really hard, that we could save these kids. That's how I used to think. But over the years, I gradually changed my mind. And I began to realize that just working hard, doing the same things, would likely improve the status quo somewhat, but it would drive all of us to an early grave, and so much more could be achieved 
by successfully implementing different ideas. Implementation is important. First you need the idea, then you need the confidence to try it, then you need to implement it properly. People always ask me how I had this vision. They come and visit and they say, well, how did you have this vision when this didn't exist? And I always say, I didn't have this vision. I promise you, I didn't have this vision. Every day I'm surprised by something here, amazed by the kindness of the pupils that they show to each other, or blown away by the quality of their work, or stunned by the extraordinary commitment staff demonstrate to the school. The most, my most recent Eureka moment was in seeing the artwork. You know, you just saw the artwork that's up there. Just incredible. I mean, these are our year nines, right? Actually, there's some year eight artwork in there as well. I mean, these are year nines doing that artwork. I, I've never seen anything like it in my life. And I, I, I'm just constantly amazed. I, I see their essays, I see their work, I go into the lessons and I just think, I can't believe this. I mean, that's genuinely what I think when I wander around the school. I just can't believe it. Michaela has come about through trial and error. There's the big stuff that you all know about, like no excuses discipline or explicit instruction. But we also looked at the details of the things we thought we could do better. And we spent a lot of time, and we still spend a lot of time, discussing every possible detail. Should the kids carry their bags, wear their coats inside, carry their books, have lots of books, take books home, how many pens, what type of pens? Should they have a rubber? Should they have a sharpener? Should they walk in silence? Silence at all times of the day? Should they walk in single file? Should they walk on the left or the right? Should we use both sides of the staircase? And that all sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? But I promise you, just discussing those details and changing our minds sometimes about them, every detail that we discussed, we've changed our mind on most of these things, and that's how Michaela has come about. Although I have to say, not the wearing of the coats inside. I've never changed my mind about that. I will never change my mind about that. I think kids wearing coats inside is just awful. It's yuck and will never happen here at Michaela. Uh, setting up Michaela took a long time. We couldn't find a building and we had a lot of people trying to stop us from opening. We failed to get a building three times before finally securing this one. Uh, so, you know, it was hard. But it meant that I had lots of time to look for like-minded people to join the cause. Uh, so many free schools, when they're opening, they have about six months to find a principal, uh, as well as a whole body of staff. And I genuinely don't know how they manage it. I mean, how do you set up a whole school in six months? I don't know. Our setbacks, in many ways, were a stroke of luck because of the time that they gave us. We used to meet once a month for a period of about 18 months in setting up the school, allowing us to discuss ideas without the challenge of running a school at the same time. That's a huge advantage when you're not having to think about your daily issues and teaching. You're just able to think about what would make a really great school. Every cloud has a silver lining, you see. And Joe Allen later will be talking about mindset and how mindset is central to what we do here at Michaela. You'll also hear from other staff, as I just said, three deputy heads that I've just listed, two heads of department, and two ordinary teachers. But my talk is about recruitment, retention, and rowing together. And I have to say, I'm not sure I've changed my mind about rowing together. Uh, I think I just added that one because it sounded good, you know, recruitment, retention, and rowing together. Uh, but we've definitely changed our minds many times over recruitment and retention. Uh, so let me just get an idea. How, are there any head teachers here today? Have you put your hands up? Great. And, and senior leaders, including the heads, who are the senior leaders? Right. And then how many people are involved in uh, appointments of, of people at your school? I see. Okay. Great, so there's some of you, because that's mainly what I'm talking about. And of course, if you're not involved, these are ideas that you can take back to your school. Um, as you all know, so my first recruitment, uh, recruitment mistake. As you all know, we've made great use of the internet to recruit. I mean, you'll be on Twitter, you'll see what we do. Uh, and this has not been a mistake. But what was a mistake was our silence in our first year on the internet. Uh, I know people can take offense at how loud Michaela teachers are on Twitter. Who do they think they are? They don't have results yet. Sure, I get it. And for that very reason, when we first opened, I insisted that all the staff should stop tweeting, stop blogging, and for all of us to go under the radar. I thought it was too dangerous. We had too many enemies. It was best for us to stay underground. And as you can imagine, over the years, uh, tons of TV people have asked to come inside the school, and I've always said no. Was it a mistake? It's hard to tell. Certainly, it was a mistake to stay quiet, generally in our first year because uh, when we were recruiting from year one to year two our silence had impact 
We had to advertise twice or three times for some posts. For science, we couldn't appoint at all. I looked at Toby Young and thought, with the West London Free School, and I thought, well, he's inundated with applications. They've got it right, I figured. You know, we need some publicity in order to attract applicants. So we changed tack. I unleashed Michaela's teachers on Twitter, and away they went. <laughs> and thank God they did. The book and the blogs have utterly transformed our applicant pool. Thanks to our shouting, we have managed to find others who think like us. And we have succeeded at building our school. And I, I genuinely, if we hadn't done that, the school would not exist, I, I promise you. Uh, so, you know, I put up with the people who say, who do you think you are, etc. Because <laughs> I know that without that, we wouldn't have our school. Um, getting word out about your school is crucial to its success, I'd say. Don't rely on the TES for recruitment. I mean, you, you'll advertise in TES, but don't just rely on that. In fact, we've even thought about advertising on Twitter, just on Twitter and on our website and not on the TES. That's how useful it's been using Twitter because so many people, like-minded people, have come to us through Twitter. Uh, we're not quite there yet. We'll still be advertising on the TES. But imagine if we ever got to a point where we were. You know, it costs nearly a grand a pop on the TES. Imagine the money that we would save if we didn't have to advertise on the TES. Um, so, recruitment number uh, mistake number two. As you all know, we do things very differently here. Uh, in particular, our teaching style is not typical of other schools. So when we first began recruiting, I mean, we, we, ju we just did things in the way that they've always been done, right? And, and this is the number one thing that I'm saying to you, don't do things as they've always been done. That's what we're about. But sometimes we have done things as they've always been done. Uh, and when we first began recruiting, we asked teachers to teach a lesson, as we still do, of course, but back then, we just let them prepare whatever they wanted for the lesson. We would always remind them how different we were, and we believed in traditional teaching, and we wanted the teacher at the front, and the desks in rows, and teaching before questioning, and all that kind of stuff. But it didn't matter how much we said it. <laughs> the interview candidates would churn out a standard interview lesson. Out came the card sorts and the dancing PowerPoints. Children would be wandering around the room. Plasticine stuck to the foreheads. Pupils were blindfolded. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And I'm... Um, I would sit at the back of the classroom, baffled by what I was seeing, thinking, well, I don't know if this candidate gets what we're about. I don't know whether he or she understands or, or even likes Michaela. And getting them to teach this lesson was a total waste of time. It was just a total waste of time. So one of our teachers pointed out to me that we needed to give candidates resources for them to teach that, that interview lesson. We needed to provide the resources, right? And we needed to tell them precisely what to do in the lesson. And even with all that support, candidates always struggle to teach in a Michaela way when they come. But at least, one, we have some idea of what they would be like if they taught here, because we're seeing them teach the way we want them to teach. And two, more importantly, two, the candidate has the opportunity to figure out whether they would be happy teaching in that way all the time. So I can have that conversation with them. And that brings me on to recruitment mistake number three. Nowadays, I begin interviews by telling candidates, this might not be the right school for you, and that's okay. Today isn't just about us figuring out whether we want you, it's about you figuring out whether you want us. And if you don't want us, we won't be offended in the slightest if you say before the day is through that this isn't for you, and we can just end the interview process. I say it to everyone. In fact, we'll have huge respect for you because we love honesty, and if you figure it out, in a couple of hours, well then what's the point of wasting everybody's time? And that has happened more than once. A candidate says, you know, it's 10 a.m. and he says, you know what, I'm not sure this is for me. We all rejoice that we're not gonna be wasting each other's time. He's able to go off and do some shopping on Oxford Street. <laughs> and we say farewell and there we go. And everybody's friends, but we're not wasting time. We weren't as clear as this uh, up front at the beginning in 2014, and that was a mistake. Now we're crystal clear and we create an environment where interview candidates are more likely to be honest and not accept a job that might not be right for them. And I think you know, all senior leaders need to have the confidence to be able to do that. The key thing I think all schools need to achieve on interview days is an environment where honesty flourishes, not one where candidates perform like SEALs and you judge the performance. You don't want, what's the point of judging a SEAL's performance? What you're looking for is to find the right person for your school, not, not to judge who has performed best on the day. I'd start by figuring out what you want. So you've got to figure out what you want, right? And then decide what interview process is going to find that person. 
Don't just do what's always been done. Which leads me to recruitment mistake number four. We used to have more than one candidate for the same post on the same day, right? And that's pretty standard. You shortlist to six, and then you have everybody in in one day, and then by the end of it, you figure out who you're going to appoint. We were like most schools. Uh, and then they all come in, and you have some complicated schedule as well, you know? You have various intray exercises, and teaching, and interview, and so and so is watching this person, and you've got the various members of senior team organized to be in different places to see everybody. And the problem with doing things this way is that you cannot create a culture of honesty when everyone is competing with each other. It's impossible. The natural inclination in humans is to want to win. And winning on interview day is getting the job. That's what it is. So they have no room in their heads to think, do I want this job? Do I want to be here? Because all they're thinking is, I want to win. I want to win. I want to get this job, right? And the sensation is heightened fourfold when other candidates are there to compete with, right? Because you're thinking, well, I want to beat him, and I want to beat her, and I want to be the best, because that's how it is, right? What I've learned over the last few years is that staff have to choose you, right? They have to choose you. If they end up at your school because they were pushed into it by a sense of wanting to win, then you will not have the best person for the job. You just won't. You won't have found someone who is truly committed to your school, or at least if you do find that you have found somebody like that, it really was just a fluke. The interview process is everything. Recruitment mistake number five. Our interview questions were standard interview questions before. They used to be standard. I mean, they were a little bit weird, but not, you know, not as weird as they are now. Um, and our questions can be really weird. Uh, and they aren't weird deliberately. But we thought long and hard about every question that we ask. And each question isn't being asked because that's what you tend to ask at interview, right? Each question is being asked because it tells us something about a characteristic that we want in our teachers. Some of you will have heard of, so other, other organizations do this, right? So there's Microsoft's in, in interview questions that you may have heard of. You know, they say things like, now obviously we don't say this, but, but, but they do. They say things like, how do you get the candy coating on, on an M&M &M, uh, so that it doesn't have the flat bit where the, if the candy was sitting there, you know, it, it should, the chocolate was sitting there, it should have a little flat bit at the bottom where it was sitting on, 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 on the plate, you know, where you put the candy on top. Um, or they ask things like, you know, why are manholes round? Um, that's because they want to know that kind of stuff. I have to say, I don't really care whether or not uh, uh, my staff know why manholes are round, um, but I don't want to leave you hanging. The answers to those questions, from what I understand, <laughs> are that M&Ms fly around in a big drum, and then the candy coating is sprayed onto them as they're flying. So that's why you don't have that, that flat bit. And as for the manholes, apparently, they are round because when the workmen want to go down, you can easily roll along that very heavy lid to get it out of the way. Um, so our questions aren't as wacky as that, but they aren't typical. And what that means is that it's impossible to prepare for our interviews. Our interviews are not seal shows uh, with typical questions. Let's say, what are your thoughts on independent learning? And, you know, and then there's a panel of four people listening, and then the, the interviewee says, well, my thoughts on, interview learning, uh, um, on uh, independent learning are X, Y, Z, because they've practiced this before. They've been on courses to learn how to answer these questions. I mean, it's utterly absurd. I mean, what is the point? I really think, I mean, what is the point? Um, all that does, uh, as we've discovered through trial and error, is give you the chance to judge who has performed best on the day, rather than find the person who is the right fit for your school. That's the key thing, the person who is the right fit for your school. So you're judging, I mean, there are people who come here, they're great teachers, they're great people, but they might not be the right fit for our school. Uh, and essentially, you just end up judging who has memorized the best answer and who's performed well, as opposed to really drilling down as best you can in just one day, and it's not long, right, to try and get to know as much as you can about the candidate. So recruitment mistake number six. I have interviewed, hang on, uh, I've interviewed for many a job in my life, and I've failed to get most of them. I mean, th th that, that's true. I'm not making that up. I have failed to get most of them. Um, you know, assistant headships, deputy headships, I can't tell you. Um, I certainly know something about rejection. And as we say to the kids all the time, you pick yourself up and you keep going. That's what we say to them all the time. You pick yourself up and you keep going. We have failed so many times at setting up the school. My father thought I was barking mad to keep going. I mean, that, he just said, you know, what is wrong with you? There's something wrong with you. It's been years. This is obviously never going to happen, right? And sometimes I do think, well, maybe I was mad. But then, you know, here we are, right? Here we are. Um, at some point last academic year, we realized that we were making the same mistake 
I think a lot of schools make, and that is not being clear who you are right from the get-go, you know? And I know that sounds a bit odd, uh, that we really weren't with, 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 with potential staff. Um, during my career, so I applied for job after job, and they were all interchangeable, really. You know, the schools were interchangeable from the perspective of the candidate because the websites all look the same. They really do. Uh, they, say the similar th they say similar things. And when that's all you've got as a candidate, where you look at the website and then you churn out one of your standard letters. And in fact, your standard letter could go to any number of schools because you're just saying, oh, I believe in independent learning and all this kind of nonsense because that's what schools want to hear. Uh, and believe it or not, Michaela, as loud as we are, <laughs> were not clear enough about what we were. Candidate after candidate would apply talking about the use of technology in the classroom, or they would talk about the learners instead of the pupils, or you know, all, all the kind of stuff that we, which drives us insane, you know? And, and, and I think, but we're Michaela, don't they know this? And um, our book has helped this issue in a big way. Again, uh, critics say, you know, why write a book when you haven't got results? Uh, and the simple answer is that we would never get good results if we hadn't written that book because it has helped us with recruitment. Uh, that book has done wonders to help us find people who think like us. But before the book, so we still have that same problem, we had the website. And while we thought that it said what we were like, we thought it said what we were like, and, and all of you will think the same thing about your websites, we'd get applications for jobs that made it clear that we, not the applicant, were doing something wrong in the way that we had explained ourselves in the advert and on the website. Applicants did not understand what made Michaela, Michaela. So we've spent some time addressing this. We created a recruitment page on the website with different testimonials from Michaela teachers talking about what's difficult about working here and what they like. The key thing was for them to be truthful, right? It was really key for them to be truthful. Um, so that applicants had some real information about the school. And they might read that and think, you know what, that's not the school for me. And that's fine, that's absolutely fine. We didn't want to put on a show for the candidate to then put on a show, for us all to then pretend to be truthful, when in fact everyone is just playing a game. And I promise you that is what is happening in recruitment, not just in schools, I would say across organizations everywhere. The key takeaway here is don't miss out on a good candidate because you make the mistake of thinking that they aren't right when actually the problem was that you weren't clear on your website what you were about, right? Because you can often turn good people away. So it's not just that you can end up appointing the wrong people, you can also turn good people away because you haven't been clear in the way that you put things across about your school. So on for retention. And when I talk about retention, what I mean by that is keeping staff happy. Uh, there are a few mistakes we've never made. So there are things like introducing performance to the red-aided pay. We've never done that. Uh, I think it's a surefire way of alienating staff from senior management and from each other. Uh, we've never done targets either for the same reasons. Uh, and we don't do grading. Uh, I realize I sound like some kind of hippie when I talk about this stuff. You know, heads are meant to be all about tracking. Heads are always saying to me, oh, I'm so great at tracking the teachers. And I always like, well, I don't track my teachers in that way. And, 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 and I sound a little bit, you know, well, I don't sound like you would imagine Catherine Burble saying Bing, right? But um, I just don't think it's the best way of getting the best out of your people, right? I, 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 I really think it undermines you as a senior team. Uh, we also didn't make the mistake when we refer refurbished of having departmental staff rooms. So the building, I think, is really important. Uh, instead, we went for one big staff room, the nicest room in the school. Okay, it is the nicest room in the school. I, I had to fight that. I had to fight with the EFA to get that for staff. Uh, and I think it's important that staff should have the nicest room, the largest room, one where they can hang out and feel appreciated. I nearly gave up on the fight because it was so difficult. Because honestly, doing new schools nowadays, they, they have a staff room the size of a cupboard. Um, but I think they need a really lovely space so that they can feel supported by each other. And a one large staff room, not these individual staff rooms per department, which split everybody up, it goes a long way to ensuring that staff feel part of one big happy family. And I think that's really important for staff's well-being. Uh, staff also need to feel successful, right? Which brings me uh, to, our, to, 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 to another retention mistake that we've made. Um, just like every other school out there, uh, we appointed people from anywhere from November to April the year before. And this, this is a big mistake that we made. I mean, I say big mistake, you know, I, I kind of forgive us because we were just doing what's always been done, but we learned from it. Uh, so we would appoint, you know, October, November, all the way up to April. And then they'd arrive in September and we give them an extra inset day and we'd cross our fingers. Well, I mean, that's a slight exaggeration in that we have a behavior boot camp 
for the children for six or seven days at the beginning of September. So we thought, you know what? This is better than anywhere else. Everybody's going to have these extra days to really get to grips with what the school's about, and they're going to just, they'll be fine because they'll have so much, so much training, right? And we discovered that that was nowhere near enough. Uh, that for a new recruit to feel comfortable at Michaela, it takes about half a term. Uh, and for them to have everything on, a, on automatic, it takes them about a term. And we realized that we needed to support them on the Michaela journey long before they joined us in September. We now have a whole onboarding strategy that is complex. It includes learning all the kids' names before you start, doing self-quizzing to death so that you know what you'll be teaching the kids inside out. It also includes lots of reading so you'll understand why, say, we have a no excuses discipline policy. So you really get what we're about long before you start in September. And this onboarding strategy has made the world of difference to how quickly new staff feel at ease here. The key thing we learned here is that it isn't just up to the individual to feel happier, the member of staff who's joining you, it's also up to the school to find all possible ways to support that individual so that they can feel more successful. The second retention mistake that we made, um, or I've made really, um, I used to say yes to a lot more things that staff would suggest that would increase their workload. So they come up to you, you know, those of you in senior team or anybody, if you're line managing anybody, you'll know they come up and they say, oh, Catherine, I've got this great idea to do this impossibly difficult trip. Or I've got this great idea to spend all of my weekends preparing this for the children. Because teachers have a way uh, with always putting the kids before themselves. You know, that's what teachers do. And that's why teachers are so fantastic. They put the children before themselves. And why, while I've always been of the opinion that the head should be there for the staff, and not the pupils, right? So you, that's my number one thing. Head should be there for the staff and not the pupils. The staff are there for the pupils. The head is there for the staff. That doesn't mean I don't like children. I love children, <laughs> right? But it means that I know that me, one person, can't possibly be there for hundreds of children. I need my staff doing that. And in order for them to be in the right mindset to be able to do that, I need to be there for them. Um, the thing is, even I, uh, w when, it's, when it's the staff member coming to you suggesting something, well, you know, you feel a bit mean to say no. And well, at the end of the day, if that's what they, how they want to spend their time, and it's a bit weird saying, well, no, you can't do that because your work-life balance matters. But um, I, 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 and I, I think that's what you have to do. I think you need to think to yourself, is that the right call here? And perhaps the teacher isn't making the right call because they're putting the children in front of themselves. And maybe their time would be better used doing something else. And you've got to have that vision for what you imagine would be best, a best use of their time. Uh, so what I've learned is that putting teachers first also means putting them first, even when they don't do this for themselves. So uh, retention mistake number three. At Michaela, we love candor. We insist that staff should voice their concerns to each other and tell each other how they feel. And I know, I know it's hard to achieve, and you'll hear more about that later on today. Um, but I do think we do a pretty good job with this. Uh, and I also personally seek feedback from staff whenever I can. Uh, but one of the mistakes that I'm still making, uh, and I've got to get better at this, is in chasing them on this point. So yes, we have performance management reviews twice a year where I ask staff how it's going and whether we can better support them. But Having established an open door culture where various staff feel happy to pop into my office for biscuits and chats, I then forget that the newer staff don't necessarily feel comfortable popping in because they're not used to that kind of culture. So I need to get better at chasing them. I also need to systematize it so that I get reminders to do it. Otherwise, I'm relying on me thinking about it constantly, and that won't necessarily happen. So I could go on forever about the things I've changed my mind on. The saying, I was blind, but now I see, applies to me tenfold when it comes to how I used to think about education. I'm grateful to all of you coming to hear from us today. But before I finish off here, uh, and there will be a bit of time to ask me questions, um, I don't suppose I can end uh, without mentioning our recent Ofsted. Uh, the report, as many of you will know, only came out yesterday. Uh, and we're grateful to have had inspectors who were open to seeing something different. If you aren't aware, uh, we were given outstanding in all categories. And it has to be said that some of the phrases in the report are very nice. Um, so I was mistaken. That's another mistake I made. The last conference we had, I was predicting a good. Uh, and the reason why I was predicting a good is not because I don't think we're a, a fantastic school. Well, it was more because I thought Ofsted inspectors may not be brave enough 
uh, they might not have been brave enough to, to give us outstanding. And so many people take Ofsted judgments very seriously. Uh, and so it was important for the revolution that it should be demonstrated that it is possible to do what is right by children. And you're ticking Ofsted boxes on the outskirts, of course, but crucially, without altering what is best for children, it is possible to get outstanding. So often senior leaders hear me talking about the school and they say, well, I mean, it's all very well being this radical, but what about Ofsted? What will they say? And a few weeks ago, I was still saying, I don't know, I don't care. All that matters is what we're doing is right for the kids. But now we do know. And I hope more than anything in the world that it will allow others the opportunity to do much of what we have done here. Michaela is an excellent school. We may also be outstanding, but we are excellent first. And excellence is all that matters in the long run. The two may overlap, of course, but all that matters is what happens day in, day out in our schools. Children put their hands in ours and ask us to teach them, to guide them, to show them right from wrong. And it is our moral duty not to be distracted from that goal. And there is so much that can distract in teaching, so much that is just all wrong. The secret to success is to see through the rubbish, all the nonsense that they ask you to do, and think, question everything, question everything all of the time. And I promise you, we'll be well on our way. Thank you. So, I think there's some microphones that are going around now. And if you have any questions for me, yes. Um, so, what I'm interested in is um, internally, do you define yourselves by your behaviour policies or your knowledge of curriculum and how kind of unique that is to your school but also other free schools? I don't know. How do we define ourselves? Um, it's a lovely place with lovely children. I don't, I don't really think about any of those things. <laughs> They're just lovely. They're so nice and kind. and and grateful and they say thank you to their teachers and they get up and give appreciations at lunchtime and it's such a pleasure to work here. Uh, morning miss, how are you miss? Um, it's such a pleasure to work with all the staff who are so committed. We feel like a big family. I mean, I don't know, we don't really think about those things. I mean, yes, we do have a knowledge curriculum and yes, we do have a no excuses discipline policy but we don't kind of walk through the day going, remember the no excuses discipline policy. I mean, <laughs> we just, I don't know, we just have a lovely day every day. Uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 it's just such fun being here. It really is. It's so nice. It's so nice because the children are just so nice. <laughs> they really are. They're just, they're just, it's such a thrill to see them every day. And they're just so, I mean, even the really naughty ones, you know, they're just so nice. I can't get this across more enough. I mean, like, you know, and if you haven't been to visit, who, who's been to visit out of interest? You must come and visit because then you'll see what I mean. They're just extraordinary, the children, and it's such a pleasure to work with them. Any others? Yep. yep. Hello. Um, I was very interested about your performance management process. You mentioned you don't have targets. So how, how do you do that? How does it work? OK, that's a really good question. So it's kind of upside down. Uh, so the reason why you know, I sound like a hippie, but I'm not actually a hippie when I say I don't believe in all this tracking, um, is because we, are, we do know what the teachers are doing, but just we're doing it the other way around. So when they arrive, we give them loads and loads and loads of feedback, and it's all about becoming a Michaela teacher. And so I know with 100% certainty, you go around the school, you will, say, you will see the same thing in all the lessons. Now, obviously, everybody has their own personality, and they bring their own thing to it. But that generally speaking, you're going to see the same thing in every lesson. And the point is that if you're seeing that in every lesson, then you're already hitting that standard. So there's no need to hold people to account by, you see, the thing I can't bear I mean, I've kind of forgotten now, but the thing I couldn't bear before uh, was this business of um, holding teachers to account by their results. Because it then becomes this whole kind of race between teachers to help the children as much as you can because you're being held to account, as opposed to children being held to account for their own results. 
Because if they have no sense of personal responsibility, that they are responsible for what they're doing, then you're, you're creating human beings that are not functional. They're not, they're not functional human beings when they leave school. And, and, and I think holding teachers to, uh, to account for, via their results is all upside down. So we do it from this, we front load it, we're, we're, we're doing lots of feedback. And remember, because we don't grade, and because we're not, the, the, that, that fear factor isn't there. Colleagues are in there supporting. And then plus we have a real open door policy. So everybody's kind of wandering in and, in and out of lessons all the time, supporting each other, helping each other to get better. So um, that coupled with the resourcing. So you know they, we're all using the same stuff in the lessons. We're all teaching the same lessons, right? So people aren't going off and making a, a random PowerPoint and delivering that. So you know that what they're delivering is of a certain quality. Um, I, I, and then it just it just works doing it that way instead of the other way. So no, we don't set targets. I mean, obviously, if there were you know heads, you would want to uh, set targets for a failing member of staff because you wanted to hold them to account. That's a different thing. But for the vast majority of people, I think there's so many systems in education that are based on the idea of the person who's failing, when 95% of everyone is doing fine. You know, um, and, and there needs to be a level of trust. We have high trust in, in the school, uh, and that they then. I'm trusting them, and uh, and I know that does sound like uh, 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 that's mad. <laughs> I know it sounds mad, but um, it creates a culture where everybody is striving to do their very best, as opposed to striving to perform like a seal when somebody's in your room. And you'll have heard that uh, theme going through everything that I was saying in terms of the interviews and so on. You don't want seal performances. <laughs> Um, there was another question here that I saw somewhere. No, up at the front. It was the same one. Same one, right? Okay, great. Any other question? Oh, yes, good. Yeah, hi. Hi. Because um, I know you like honest feedback. A manhole covers around because if they're around, they don't fall into the manhole. Can oh yes, there's that too. <laughs> Anyway. Well, no, there's no, but they, they say the two things. You're right. Anyway, Thank um, you. <laughs> Here is a man who knows all about Microsoft's uh, uh, interview techniques. Um, no, my question um, has to do with retention. So do you worry, and I appreciate it's a quality problem, do you worry that once you, as you, your reputation continues to get out there, that, um, and you have such good teachers, that then people will come and try and poach your teachers. So is that going to be an issue for you? Um, and it could be a positive thing, because the Michaela way could be spread around the country, which would be good. But from your side, it means you then have to constantly be training new people coming in. That's true. And, and it's already happening. <laughs> well, that, the, the poaching is already happening. Um, you know, I mean, people have their lives to live. People have to move house. They 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 have children. They you know they do things and, and their lives take them in different directions. Um, while I would love all of the Michaela staff to stay with us forever, I recognise that that won't necessarily happen for everyone at Michaela. Um, but I'm really happy that they're able to come here and benefit from uh, what we do here, so that they can then go off and implement those ideas elsewhere. Um, because I mean that's what you know why why are we having this conference right to to spread the ideas. Uh, because we're a school that's about our school, but we're also about the larger revolution. And I do believe it is a revolution. And the more people there are thinking in this way, uh, the better off education will be in the country as a whole. Any other questions? No? Um, I had a question around um, recruitment, the interview process. Could you give us an example, a couple of examples of questions that you think are good <laughs> at diagnosing whether this candidate is right for Michaela? Thank you. I'm not sure I want to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think I can, because then, you see, you know, I, I like to te ask the questions and then, you know, I get their, their honest reaction. Because if I don't get their honest reaction to the questions, then it sort of undermines it because then people are saying, oh, prepare for this question and say this and say that. And so I don't think I can answer your question. I'm sorry. But look, you all know your school. So you know, if you think to yourself, we need somebody who's really resilient, right? Uh, let's say you're in a school that has very difficult behavior. It's a challenging school. You're trying to turn it around, and it's got difficult behavior. Um, then you're thinking, well, what are the characteristics that we need? If you're not really resilient, then you're going to fall apart in the first couple of months, and you're going to be off. So you don't want somebody who's going to be shy and retiring and so on. Um, 
And so then you would ask questions to see whether or not. A lot of the questions that we ask are things like, imagine this scenario, what would you do, right? So you might describe, you see, what, in that scenario, if, if it was a challenging school, you're being upfront about it. You're saying, look, we are a challenging school. We have these behavior issues. All right, we are turning things around. Do you want to join the team to do that? And then you're asking them, right, so pupil you know, is in a massive fight. There's a huge brawl. What, what do you do? You know? And you ask them to see, are they the kind of person who's going to deal with it, or are they going to run away, for instance? right? You all know your schools and what the issues are and, and, and the things that staff have struggled with in the past. That's what's key. Right? So you learn from old staff what thing people have struggled with, and then you are asking about that uh, at interview. OK? Any other questions? No? OK, great. Um, nothing off in the internet. Perfect. Well, that's perfect timing. So uh, I will now uh, pass over to Joe Kirby, who's going to te talk to us about assessment. And just to say, when you are asking your questions on the mics, just make sure the mics are up by your really close to your mouth so that so that they work. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much.